Welcome back to Half the Battle. I'm your host as always, Daniel Levy, your co-host Shaq. We're going to be talking UFC Uruguay, Valentina Shevchenko versus Liz Carmouche, and Shaq is going down this Saturday in Montevideo. The rematch between Valentina Shevchenko and the first woman to ever defeat her, Liz Carmouche. Yeah, this is a rematch. Uh, it's been a long time in the making. You know, Liz Carmouche, she was the first ever female to enter the octagon, and now uh, they're feeding her to their new 125-pound dominant champion, Valentina Shevchenko. And I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what's going to be the result here, but I think it's a good uh, a good storyline heading into the fight. And not to mention, we got Vicente Luque, the silent assassin, and Platinum Mike Perry. I mean, anytime you hear those two names, you know somebody might get knocked out. So I'm definitely looking forward to this card. Yeah, and Liz Carmouche is definitely no pushover. Obviously, she finished Valentina Shevchenko the first time they fought. She also has a stoppage win over current champion Jessica Andrade, in addition to wins over Caitlin Chukagian, Jennifer Maya, Lucy Pudilova. So when you talk about Liz Carmouche, she definitely earned this title shot against the reigning defending Valentina Shevchenko. And for Shevchenko, how good of an accomplishment would it feel for her to go out there and not just beat Liz Carmouche, but to avenge the first loss of her career. Yeah, and you know, if she if she starts building a pattern for these uh, vicious finishes like we saw in her last fight, I mean, we could be looking at the next, uh, you know, UFC superstar. Yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, she said she has unfinished business with Amanda. I kind of disagree. I got, I got it scored 2-0, Amanda, right now. But at the same time, she can build her own legacy. And like you already uh, mentioned earlier, the co-main event between Vicente Luque and Mike Perry. You know for a fact those two are going to stand and bang until one man falls or until both men receive a 50k uh, direct deposit into their bank account. So I just know for a fact that uh, it's going to be a very lively night of fights uh, down in in South America this weekend, Shaq. Yeah, 100%. Well, let's get right down to business because first up in the flyweight division, we got Pollyanna Vienna. She's 10-3 and and Veronica Macedo is 5-3. and Currently, they got Pollyanna Vienna. She's a plus 115 dog. Veronica Macedo is minus 135. So, Shaq, would you advise taking the chalk on an 0-3 UFC fighter and Veronica Macedo here? Yeah, you know, when you look at uh, both these girls' careers, you know, it's been big letdowns for both of them. I mean, Pollyanna Vienna had all the hype in the world coming into her UFC debut. But, you know, she fought a complete soccer mom in her debut in, uh, um, what's her name? Maya Stevenson, and, you know, it was an easy first-round finish, and then they matched her up with J.J. Aldridge. We saw her leave her chin sky high in the air. Her takedown defense wasn't good. She's She's got some good subs, but, you know, positionally speaking, she's not very good either on the mat. Um, and then her fight with Hannah, Hannah Cyphers, I mean, you know, it was a, a decent fight back and forth, but, you know, it was the same issues, you know, her chin up in the air, her, her boxing is terrible, and she's just uh, not as good as everyone thought she was. And between you and me, Dan, uh, I think we know that she didn't beat up that guy, uh, <laughs> beat up that guy that uh, that they claim that she beat up. And then you look at Macedo, on the other hand, I would say her issues is just men. She's been fighting, you know, really good opponents. She lost to Ashley Evan Smith at 135 pounds, I believe, which is not a weight class she's uh, that she shouldn't be fighting in. And then her, her last two losses to uh, Andrea KGB Lee, you know, who's arguably, in my opinion, I'm not saying she's a dark horse at 125, but, you know, she possibly might work her way up into that top, you know, three or five. She's got a big fight coming up. And then um, her last fight against Jillian Robertson. Jillian Robertson, you know, the submission specialist of the division. I mean, Jillian's ground game is, you know, pretty disgusting, man. You got to give her props. And Macedo, that's her that's her hole in her game, even though I think she's a, a brown belt in jiu-jitsu. I feel like, you know, Vienna probably has... A slight edge in, in, in submission ability, you know, maybe uh, reversals and things like that. But in terms of the positioning aspect of things, I feel like uh, it's it's 50-50. And on the feet, I definitely see Macedo getting the better of the exchanges. I mean, unless Viana's fixed a lot of those holes in her game, but I just feel like that's just how she's going to be striking moving on here, uh, moving on out. I, I think Macedo's going to get a win here. I think she's going to land the harder strikes. I think that, uh, you know, it, it possibly could be a very close fight. I don't think either one of them are trustworthy, especially Macedo at minus money. But I am going to uh, pick her for the win here. I think she's going to land that body kick. I think uh, she's going to land some straight lefts, have a uh, a couple flurries in there, and uh, finally get in the win column in the UFC. Basically, in this fight, you got a matchup between someone with very suspect submission defense in Veronica Macedo versus someone with uh, very questionable striking defense in Pollyanna Vienna. As you mentioned, Pollyanna 
Pollyanna Vienna fights with that chin straight up in the air. And Veronica Macedo, if you take her back, the fight will be over shortly after. And I think that 90% of fights do hit the mat, so I'm actually going to go with the underdog here with Pollyanna Vienna. I think that's going to be close while it lasts, but at some point she will take the back and she will strangle her. So I got Pollyanna Vienna via submission. Next up in the welterweight division, we got Gilbert Dorinho Burns. He's 15 and 3, and Alexei Kunchenko is 20 and 0. Currently, they got Alexei Kunchenko minus 145. The comeback on Gilbert Dorinho Burns is plus 125. Well, Shaq. You called it, man. You said that Gilbert Dorinho Burns is going to move up to 170. It's just uh, we didn't quite think it was going to be on that short of notice uh, this weekend against Kunchenko. So who you got in this matchup? Gilbert Burns uh, seems to, at 155, seem to, you know, be kind of finding somewhat of a groove. And, you know, unfortunately, he's grown out of the weight class. And it's, a, you know, in the long-term scheme of things, it's better that he uh, realized now instead of, you know, taking a, another KO loss at 155 or something like that. You know, I mean, we've heard stories about Gil we've already seen him get pulled off cards before for uh, the commission not allowing him to cut weight. And then if you look at his last fight against Mike Davis, he was the last one to weigh in. And apparently uh, he, he didn't have a fun time. And he said uh, he was done with 155. So but like Gilbert's probably been making the right decision. Now he's taking this fight on short notice. That's generally what guys can do when they move up a weight class. Their bodies are a lot more fresh. And now he took a fight against uh, Kunchenko. And Kunchenko's undefeated. He's 20-0. I describe him as just uh, he's super efficient, man. You know, this guy it isn't necessarily going to open up and, you know, start swinging for the fences, but he's going to, you know, keep his defense tight. He's going to just cut off the ring slowly, very efficiently. And then when it's time to turn up towards the end of the rounds, he'll turn up at the end of the rounds and solidify those rounds. And the guys take down defense is top notch. I mean, he's a, he's a big force. You know, I would say Kunchenko's, you know, my concerns with Kunchenko's, uh, you know, in the future will be that, you know, he is 20 and oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that first style is coming up. Uh, very soon and his volume is a little low as the as the competition gets better he might not be able to necessarily get away with just chilling 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 and selling those rounds at the end now this fight with Gilbert Burns you know I feel like Gilbert Burns has definitely improved uh, you know from the Rashid Magomedov days definitely a hole in his game and the hole in his game is when he fights really sharp technical straight punchers or, you know, guys that stay composed in the pocket, like the Hooker fight, for example, or the Rashid Magomedov fight, for example. Gilbert just has a tendency to start swinging for the fences. And, you know, sometimes he can get knocked down, uh, knockdowns and, you know, do his thing on the map. But this guy, Kunchenko, man, he just keeps his focus in there. And, you know, it's not the most, you know, uh, fan fan pleasing style but man it's super efficient it gets the job done and i think he's probably going to get the job done here you know as long as he doesn't get caught with a big punch he is undefeated like i said that first l could be coming but i just think he's the better overall fighter i don't see burns being able to get him to the mat the only possible thing i could see is burns possibly catching him with a counter right hand which is you know one of his money moves but i just think alexi is the the uh, more sustainable fighter throughout the 15 minutes and i think he's gonna you know move on to 21 and 0 gilbert burns has really come a long way man because i remember there was a time there when we really were criticizing his striking defense, you know, he would take a lot of shots on the feet. But now, man, I, he really has been becoming a lot more composed in there. He's a lot more effective. And when he lands that overhand right on people, uh, bodies tend to hit the floor, Shaq. So Gilbert Dorinho Burns definitely has a lot of knockout power. And not to mention his jujitsu pedigree. This guy takes your back. Chances are you are getting strangled. But when you talk about Alexei Kunchenko, you're talking about one of the best Russian coasters in the entire sport. I mean, the guy's 20 and 0 for a reason, and it's not no padded record either. I mean, the guy's been out here fighting Ovs in Russia, you know, and now he already beat two UFC vets decisively in my opinion, and now he's taking on another one and I simply feel like Gilbert Dorinho is too small for Alexei Kunchenko. Now, I know someone might counter me and say, Gilbert's the taller man. He's the, He might even have a reach advantage, this and that. It's like, guys, I don't care if he's the taller man. The guy, you know what it would take for Alexei Kunchenko to make 55? He'd have to cut off his leg. That, that's what I'm trying to say here. Gilbert can make 55. Kunchenko can't. And not only that, Kunchenko, it, it's going to kind of be like that Prezerish fight where the bigger man is just going to bully uh, Gilbert Dorinho around that cage. Now, I don't know. I don't necessarily think he's going to get as many takedowns as Tractor Prazerish did, but I still think that when he lands his shots, Gilbert's really going to feel it. And 
Gilbert does hit very hard, but I don't think it's going to have the same effect on Alexei Kunchenko as, say, it did on Jason Sago or Dan Moret or, you know, guys like that. And when you look at the last couple of guys that Gilbert Greenhill has been beating, and no disrespect, I'm not discrediting his resume at all. It's just when you compare them to Kunchenko, there, there's no comparison whatsoever. I mean, let, let's be honest here. Jason Sago, fraud. Dan Moret, fraud. Olivier Aubin Mercier, fraud. Mike Davis, featherweight. So I, I just don't think that there's any comparison here between the guys he's been beating and Alexei Kunchenko. I see this as a massive step up. And I see Alexei Kunchenko coming out here, rushing, coasting uh, to a nice unanimous decision victory here. Now, next up in the lightweight division, we got Alex Leco da Silva. He's 20 and 2. And Rodrigo Vargas is 11 and 2. Currently, they got Alex Leco da Silva minus 275. The comeback on Rodrigo Vargas is plus 235. Well, Shaq, we're very familiar with Alex Leco da Silva. We even bet him at good dog odds in his UFC debut. And it was going according to plan. It was like, yes, Leco, yes, Leco. And then all of a sudden, it's like, no, Leco, no, wait, please. And, uh, so now I got to ask you, man, is he going to get back on track here against Rodrigo Vargas, who comes into the UFC with a win over a UFC vet and a win over a contender series vet? Vargas is a tough Mexican fighter. Fighter. We know what those tough Mexican fighters bring to the table. They're willing to bang. They're willing to take punishment. And they're willing to dish it out as well. And if they start noticing any uh, sign of weakness, then you know they'll they'll break you. And Alex da Silva in his UFC debut, behind the scenes, there was definitely a lot of stuff going on. I mean, Paul Felder said it. He said his team was uh, employing uh, Alex uh, Leco da Silva to stay in the sauna just to make this weight. And the fight was on short notice. He, he was pretty much doomed from doomed from the start. And now I feel like, you know, his second UFC fight is a little bit of role reversals. Now you got Rodrigo Vargas coming in on short notice. And Alex da Silva is the guy that's had the full camp. He was the guy getting ready for, you know, a, a Muay Thai striker in Fiziev. And, you know, when you look at Rodrigo Vargas's game, that's based, I'm going to describe it as a tough Mexican fighter. He's willing to bang in the pocket, but he eats a lot of shots. His takedown defense isn't good. And, you know, he's got some wins over Jordan Williams back in 2014, which are definitely uh, very respectable. And Mike Delatore, who, you know, is a, also a very tough Mexican. But skill level wise, I think Alex De Silva is considerably better than him in the wrestling, striking, in terms of picking his shots, moving. And you know, now that he's got this full camp and with a better weight cut, I actually think he comes in and get and gets a nice little finish over Rodrigo Vargas, takes his back and gets a submission. Yeah, look, Rodrigo Vargas coming into this debut already has got that win over Jordan Williams, who fought on contender series twice. And he knocked out Mike Delatore exactly how you're supposed to in under a minute with a vicious head kick. So Rodrigo Vargas, I mean, he's already seen guys that have been inside the octagon. He's beaten them. Now he got that debut. And I think the guy is extremely tough. And with Alex Da Silva, hopefully the weight cut goes better this time because what we saw in that first round from him, I was like, okay, this is a very physical guy for 155 pounds. And you look at his record, 20 and 2. Now I know we can sit here and talk about, you know, those padded Brazilian records. You remember my boy Tomas Almeida, who somehow still ranked top 15. Explain that to me. But. You know, we thought Alex Da Silva might have one of those records, but man, he looked pretty impressive in that debut. Unfortunately, you know, I do think the weight cut ended up playing a big factor. You saw him gas unexpectedly out of nowhere. I think in this fight, he's going to be a little bit more well conditioned. And just the composure of already having that experience behind him will probably lead him to victory here. It's just that when you're fighting one of these Mexican warriors, you know, if what happened the first time happens again, Rodrigo's going to take him out in that second or third round. It's just that I'm expecting. A more, uh, a more focused, a more disciplined, and a more composed version of Leco da Silva. So I'm going to pick him to win for that reason. Next up in the Bantamweight division, we got Geraldo de Freitas. He's 12-4, and four, and Chris Gutierrez is 13-3. and three. Currently, they got Geraldo de Freitas minus 140. The comeback on Chris Gutierrez is plus 120. Well, Shaq, both these guys are coming off pretty impressive unanimous decision wins. Who's going to make it two wins in a row inside the UFC's octagon? This fight has a, had a lot of line movement on it. I mean, it opened up plus 150. De Freitas now is minus 140. De Freitas seems like De Freitas is the is the uh, key man this weekend for a lot of people. Now, De Freitas had a very good debut against Colores, who you know, uh, upset that guy, Domingo Pilarte, and that could be, you know, somewhat of a reason why you see this line movement, because turns out Colores was a lot better than people thought after he dropped down, uh, dropped down and waited. Now you got De Freitas, who's doing the same thing. They fought at 145 on short notice. He's dropping down, and Gutierrez, you know, 
Gutierrez, I'd say he, he's definitely gotten a little better over the years in comparison to his World Series days. But, you know, I think that this guy, uh, his last fight against Ryan McDonald, look, Ryan McDonald's a nice kid, but he's very green. He's very young in his career. Gutierrez was able to get through. Yeah, he's definitely the better fighter, better. He's got better movement, better kickboxing. I just think that Geraldo de Freitas, you know, training at Novo and Yao is definitely going to be a lot tougher to fight. And mainly due to his length, man, this guy is super long and he knows how to jab. He's got great jujitsu. He out grappled uh, Colores in that debut fight. And, you know, I feel like that's been a weakness for in, throughout Gutierrez's career. He's known for his famous, uh, you know, controversial win over Timor Valia. But in the rematch, I mean, he got completely dominated on the, on the mat. Then he fought uh, Hayoni Barcelos in his debut, got completely dominated on the mat. And, you know, I, I must say he was a beneficiary of, of, of slight competition. So I think, you know, the line movement, I'm going to agree with it this time. I think Gerardo de Freitas is going to come out here and probably use a, a Brazilian Aldo type of style. If he can get the takedowns, he can. But I think he's going to stick to that jab, an occasional low kick if uh, Gu- if he can catch Gutierrez switching stances. He likes to switch stances a lot. But I think he's got better boxing. And I think that, you know, he doesn't really strike me as a gasser because he's got that long, rangy type style. So I actually like uh, Gerardo de Freitas in this spot. This is an interesting fight because it seems to me like not only are these two huge bantamweights but you got a very good Muay Thai striker in Chris Gutierrez I mean this guy's kicks are very serious against a very well-rounded guy in Geraldo de Freitas I mean we saw Geraldo mix it up with the boxing he can transition his strikes to his takedowns Uh, I know he's a big fan of GSP so that's that's going to be the key factor here because with Chris Gutierrez if he can get it in that Muay Thai range and you know trade kicks for kicks, like, you know, who can kick harder? That's the kind of fight where Chris Gutierrez is really going to thrive. Or if he gets a walking punching bag like Ryan McDonald. Like, if you give me Chris Gutierrez versus Lewis Smolka, we're, you know, we're taking uh, that Chris Gutierrez dog money all the way to the bank. But here against Geraldo de Freitas, I just think he's outmatched in all areas. While I do think that the stand-up can be a little bit close, I, I just think that if it, if it happens to get a little sketchy for Geraldo, duck under change levels take this guy to the mat he's not going to be able to get back up because yeah we can sit here and say hi only barcelos you know he took him down the fight was over shortly after when he got his back there was no getting out of it okay that's hi only fine but what about when ryan mcdonald's taking this guy down easily passing the side control and he can't get up that that that's what i'm wondering here and i know that against these inexperienced guys chris gutierrez can pull some stuff off on the mat you know he's he likes his guillotine He attacks off his back from time to time. I just think that when you're talking about a black belt like Geraldo de Freitas, he will be able to pass that guard, get to side control, and from there, he's going to have a lot of options to work with, whether it's the Darce Choke, whether it's the Anaconda, whether, I mean, even an an Americana, a Kimura, he can take his back, Mata Leo, rear naked choke. There's so many options here for Geraldo de Freitas, and even though all this line movements come in on him, I think it's right, man. I actually think he should be a bigger favorite in this spot because he's got a lot of advantages here. So as long as Geraldo does what he's supposed to do, get this guy to the mat, I think he's going to win pretty comfortably. Next up in the flyweight division, we got an all-out war between Haulian Paiva. He's 18-2, and two, and Rogerio Bontorin is 15-1. and one. Well, Shaq, I know you remember a week or two ago when I said that Davison Figueredo versus Alexandre Pantoja was the fight to watch. Well, now you got Howley and Paiva, who's 18-2, and two, taking on Rogerio Bontorin, who's 15-1. and one. You don't often see those kind of records up against each other. I mean, these are two of the top guys in the flyweight division, even though we've only seen them each once. I mean, who do you think gets the big win here? Yeah, this is going to be a complete war. I mean, yeah, this fight reminds me a lot of Pantoja and Davison Figueredo. I mean, if you watch these two guys contender series fights on... Uh, on Contender Series Brazil, I mean, man, they were they were two wars, man. Bontarin, I mean, he fought a very good guy. I think the kid was undefeated that he fought a super long flyweight. And, I mean, Bontarin was on the ropes again and finished, and he somehow gathered himself, took the kids back, and, and tapped them out. I mean, Bontarin's jiu-jitsu is no joke. To be able to pull that off while he's still a little, a little bit concussed, and the way he came back and proved himself against Magomed Bubalatov, who I know had a lot to prove coming off his loss against Moraga, I mean, 
Bontarin won the first round in that fight, and Bibalatov was throwing some heat in that fight, and, you know, he lost his second, and he gathered himself once again, and, uh, you know, he, he was able to outwork Bubalatsov, land the harder shots in that third round, get a, a little takedown, and Bontarin, I got a lot of respect for him. He's a Brazilian farmer. I mean, he's got that real grip strength, and the dude uh, comes to fight, and then you look at Paiva on the other hand. I mean, this kid is so good for his age. He's so young, so super experienced, and Man, Paiva will come after you. And his fight against uh, Kai Car France in his debut, we bet on him at plus uh, two something. I can't remember the exact number, but you know it went to split decision, and it was a very close fight. France is a very good prospect as well. And as far as both guys holes in their game, I'd say Bontarin's hole is that you know he he has a although he's a great fighter, you know he definitely has a little bit of Brazilian mummy style in him. Uh, it, it seems like somewhere you know. In that second round, mid stage, he, he can get a little tired, and then he'll start charging forward like a mummy, start taking a lot of punches. But he's been able to gather himself. And then Paiva, on the other hand, his issue is when he does come after you, he occasionally leaves his chin up. And you know, with guys like High Car France, Monterine, the guys that you know aren't gonna fade. I mean, if he uh, keeps doing that, he might get caught, and he and he might uh, get wobbled. Or Dressing could use a little bit of work as well. So Paiva probably has him beat on the mat a little bit, but I don't think he's gonna be able to hold Paiva down. Through, throughout the 15 minutes. I mean, Paiva's just too much of a dog. Like, the kid's not going to quit. And on the feet, I slightly favor Paiva because although I think Bontarin's going to get off on some things, I just feel like the length and the uh, the way Paiva moves forward in, the, in those late rounds is going to really play trouble. I definitely expect Bontarin to get wobbled in this fight. It's just a matter of how uh, one-sided or if it's going to be one-sided are the tie-ups and the ground exchange is going to go, you know? So... I'm actually going to go with Paiva. I think he's a little younger. I think he could take a little bit more. I think he can move forward. But I got a lot of respect for Bontarin. I think it's going to be a tough fight. But I think with Paiva's youth, his uh, the fact that he's uh, – I think he might be a little bit hungrier for a win. not saying Bontarin isn't. But I think that uh, he's going to make a lot of improvements. Did this full camp at Team Alpha Male in the United States. And I think he gets the win here. Man, this is such a good fight. These two are going to go to war. The scramble is going to be incredible. The stand-up exchanges. Uh, these two are going to stand and bang. It's going to be an amazing fight. So what's interesting to me is that I feel like Rogerio Bontorra is probably the stronger guy. You mentioned he is a farmer. You know how strong those guys are. Just ask my boy Zaleski. And with Howley and Paiva, super long for a flyweight division. I mean, it's not often you get five foot eight guys with 70 inch reaches at 125 pounds, but that's exactly what this guy is. And Holly and Pipe is one of those guys where if you don't knock this guy out, he's going to keep coming forward the entire night. And what's interesting is that Hojera Bontorin, he is the stronger guy. So he might have an edge in terms of ending rounds with takedowns and sealing them off that way. And I could totally see the first two rounds going uh, Bontorin's way just because of his strength. But the thing is, you mentioned that gas tank and the fact that Holly and Paiva is that guy who's just going to go forward the entire time. And you start to slow down on a guy like Holly and Paiva, and he will tee off on you. So interestingly enough, Shaq, what I think is going to happen in this fight is I think Hogera Bontorin is going to come out here, win the first two rounds slightly, just edge him out with a takedown. But in that third round, I see a 10-8 round. For Holly and Paiva, I see Hojera Bontran slowing down to a point where Holly and Paiva is going to tee off on him, and we're going to get a draw. This is going to be an amazing fight. It's going to be fight of the night. I think this fight's going to end in a draw. Next up in the strawweight division, we got Tisha Torres. She's 10-4, and four, and Marina Rodriguez is 11-0. and 0. Currently, they got Tisha Torres minus 155. The comeback on Marina Rodriguez is plus 135. Well, Shaq, I think they're at the point now with Tisha Torres where it is uh, feeding her to, to their prospects to see exactly where they stack, see where they measure. Well, the last prospect, who was only 2-0 and in the UFC, Wiley Zhang, she went out there and beat Tisha Torres and got a title shot as a result. Do you think Marina Rodriguez can come out here as an underdog, get the upset, and uh, move up the ranks? This is a big fight for Marina Rodriguez, and that's all she gets is big fights. You know, they started her off with Randa Marcos in her debut, and... Uh, you know, she won two out of the three rounds. It was just the first round was a little bit too one-sided on the mat. Felt like she came back and definitely made a, you know, some some improvement in her next fight against Jessica Aguilar. You know, uh, another tough Mexican fighter that likes to move forward, likes to clinch, likes to grapple. And Marina, you know, was in an armbar spot with her. But hey, you know, she got out of it, showed composure. And to be honest, man, I feel like Marina got robbed out of a second round knockout. I mean, I thought the fight should have been stopped multiple times. I mean, 
Aguilar's face was, there was chunks hanging off. I mean, I don't know what Keith Peterson was thinking, but that was one of his worst jobs uh, that I've seen in a long time. So, you know, I feel like Marina's honestly coming off a second round knockout. You know, she's still undefeated and now she's getting that stuff up in Tisha. Tisha's the perennial top 10 fighter who's been the top 10 fighter since this division came into existence. Tisha is a girl that, man, you know, when you really look at her record and you see, you know, that she's on this three fight skid and, you know, we know it's against... Andrade champion, Joanna, former champion, and Wiley Zhang, the number one contender right now. Some would say, you know, this is a step down in competition for Tisha, but the, the, the issue with Tisha is it's more mental, you know, and the fact that she's also had a very long career in competing, man, you know, even if we look at her coming off tough, we know that she, on tough she lost to Randa Marcos, we know that she lost to Carla Esparza, and when you really look at her wins, uh, she does have the win over, over Watterson. But uh, other than that, man, we're only talking about Beck Rawlings, um, Jocelyn. Angela Magana. Yeah, you know, Magana, Jocelyn jones uh Juliana Lima. It's definitely, uh, I would say, an inflated uh, ranking position that she had. But she did have the one over Watterson, which I guess has that name value. But uh, she beat Angela Hill as well. She just hasn't been able to evolve in these last three fights and really the main thing i'm seeing in these three fights is honestly you know the andrage fight was a, a tough fight i would say she showed effort but really in these last two against joanna and zang i'm seeing a, a, a lack of effort to be honest you know i feel like i'm not gonna say she's giving up but i just feel like she's okay with not getting beat up too bad if you know what i'm trying to say uh you know, I feel like <laughs> she's kind of out there fighting just to not get dominated, you know, and she and it's progressively been getting worse, These, uh, especially these last two fights. I mean, the last two rounds of the Zhang fight were low-key uh, a clinic, you know, and, and she just hasn't evolved. She's 5'1". She likes to dance on the outside. You know, she's got some big muscles, but I just feel like when things come easy to her, when she's able to to capitalize on girls like Beck Rawlings who don't win in the UFC or, you know, Juliana Lima who, you know, is a complete can. And, you know, Watterson at the time, I mean, I bet on Tisha in that fight. I, you know, she was showing signs of being a, a mom and, and, you know, looking for ways out. So when things are easy for Tisha, she's out there having fun. But then when things are not going Tisha's way, she's a completely different fighter. She shuts down. She stops throwing. And if you do that with Marina Rodriguez, Marina is the type of girl that can inflict damage, you know. I'm talking cuts. I'm talking serious, crucial blows. And she's definitely got that long frame. Her takedown defense is still it's definitely getting better, but it's still a working progress. But when you look at the takedown accuracy, that's that's uh, the whole in Marina's game. When you look at the takedown accuracy of Tisha Torres, we're only talking 16%. And it just seems like the volume is is lessening each fight so i think this is a good spot for marina to come in here come in here and do her thing i feel like this is uh they're trying to groom her for this spot i feel like if she keeps this fight at range a couple knees in the clinch uh, tisha's very short i feel like she'll be able to grab that plum and i feel like if we can get some blood up open on tisha i feel like she will just progressively start to shut down and marina will just flat out throw more be more aggressive being aggressive is not an issue for marina rodriguez this girl comes to fight every single time i mean she throws real blood blows in there so i got marina rodriguez by 30 27 in uruguay getting the biggest one of her career and uh i think she's gonna finally hit those rankings this is kind of funny man because the way people are talking about tisha here kind of reminds me last week you know a much lower level example but that mickey gall versus salim fight let me explain what i mean by that you know everyone was making such a big deal about how he only lost to warley and Ketara. well now it's she only lost to Jessica Andrade and Joanna and Wiley Zhang. It's like, yeah, I get that she lost to these great fighters and uh, my girl Marina would probably lose to them too, but it's like we didn't see any effort in those three fights, man. It, it, she wasn't fighting with any spirit whatsoever, so I just don't give her a pass just because it was some great fighters out there. I just saw complete domination all three fights, man. And the Wiley Zhang fight, people are overrating Wiley Zhang to a point where I mean, we're not going to say too much yet because that fight's coming up. But, I mean, have you seen that betting lot? You know what I'm saying? So, look, uh, I guess beating Tisha Torres gets you a title shot these days. You know what I mean? So, as far as this matchup's concerned, what I'm most worried about when I talk about Marina Rodriguez is people going out there and wrestling her. 
Okay, well, guess what Tisha Torres' biggest issue has been throughout her career? Her getting wrestled as well, you know? Tisha Torres is a Taekwondo fighter. She's been doing this stuff since she was five years old. She's had a long career even before she got to the UFC. I think she's had enough. I think she's looking to go do other things, man. I mean, she's actually a really smart girl. You know, she got a degree while she was in the UFC. I got a lot of respect for Tisha Torres, but now she's at that point in her career where... The sport is evolving to a point where these fighters aren't just coming in hungrier than you. They're a lot bigger than you, too. I mean, Marina Rodriguez has a 5-inch height advantage, 5-inch reach advantage. She lands more than two strikes per minute more than Tisha Torres. And, you know, Tisha Torres used to be known for her output. Well, now she's about to get out volume. So unless Tisha Torres comes out here with some disciplined wrestling game plan, which that 16% takedown offense doesn't indicate she has... I think Marina Rodriguez is about to come out here and out-volume her. It's going to be a Muay Thai clinic. The straight punches, the elbows, the knees, the teeps, the kicks, everything. So I'm going uh, Marina Rodriguez for the upset via unanimous decision here. Next up in the heavyweight division, we got Cyril Gan. He's 3-0. and And Rafael Pezoa is 9-0. Currently, they got Cyril Gan minus 430. The comeback on Rafael Pezoa is plus 345. Well, Shaq, word on the street is this Cyril Gan guy is Francis Ngannou's protege. He allegedly was going to sign with Glory and had a fight booked versus Rico Verhoeven. But then he got that UFC call, decided this is what he wants to do. Do you think he comes out here and beats a guy in Rafael Pezoa who has three times as much experience as him inside the cage? Yeah, uh, they are sure hyping this guy up, aren't they? Huh? <laughs> but yeah, you know, this fight against Rafael Pezoa was a real gain. It's definitely, we know what they're trying to do. We know that they're trying to bring in this tough workman-like Brazilian fighter to come in here and, and get knocked out by the much faster, agile guy in Cyril Gan. And Now, are you sure that uh, he's Francis's protege or pr Francis's punching bag? <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, when we hear some of these stories, man, don't, uh, you know, they always tend to do this, put too much pressure on the guy. But, you know, unfortunately for Pessoa, I just think the speed advantage is going to be way too much here. And the only concern I have for Gain is that, you know, he's a, he fights with his hands down and a heavyweight, anything can happen. And, you know, uh, as he moves up in competition, there's definitely going to be some guys that are going to counter him. But I like the level of opponents they're starting him at. No offense to Basoa, a very tough guy. But I do think that, you know, Surreal Gain is probably going to end up slipping a punch and just, you know, throwing a straight right down the middle and probably knocking him out. He, he's just too much faster than a half fight up. So it's a big speed advantage. So I'm going to go with Gain for a knockout. Yeah, the thing here with this guy, Cyril Gan is that he's a freak athlete, a real specimen when you see him out there. Also has that kickboxing background. So, man, his finished product is going to be something you got to look out for. It's just a matter of are they going to ruin his chin on the come up? Because he's only 3-0, and you know, making his UFC debut, Shaq. But I do think he has the athleticism. Uh, necessary to not just beat Pessoa based on speed, but to kind of close that gap between the last time we saw him and this Saturday to, to just level up a little bit. You know what I mean, man? To get more skill, round out your game a little bit. And I think he does have enough to come out here and knock out Rafael Pessoa. Look, nothing's going to surprise me. It's heavyweights. The guy's three times more experienced than him. But when I saw that raw athleticism, I just got to side with Gane here. I think he gets past this one. And we got to be a... Uh we got to keep a, a close eye on who they match him up with in the future because there might be some fade opportunities, but I don't think that this Saturday is going to be the time. Next up in the featherweight division, we got Enrique El Fuerte Barzola. He's 15-4, and four, and Bobby Muffet is 14-4. and four. Currently, they got Enrique Barzola minus 135. The comeback on Bobby Muffet is plus 115. Well, Shaq, these two are most likely going to have a scramble fest. It's going to be very exciting to see how this fight unfolds on the mat. But that being said, sometimes when you got two grapplers, it turns into a striking match. So how do you see this fight playing out? Man, I feel like this could possibly be, uh, you know, a possible sleeper for fight of the night. Bobby Moffat is coming off a of fight of the night in his last fight, and we, we've seen the type of fights that El Forte has been in the past, uh, you know, with, like guys against, uh, like against uh, Gabriel Benitez when he fought him in Texas. And, you know, this is an interesting fight to me because, you know, when I watch Bobby Moffat, I see a guy, I think he's, what's his record, 14 and 4? Yes. Yeah, he's 14 and 4. He's got 18 pro fights. He's still a, a, a relatively young guy. 
He comes from a good camp. Uh, actually, both guys are switching camps from this fight. Moffitt left the lab. Now he's at Fight Ready in Neuroforce 1. And Enrique left ATT, and now he's at AKA. So uh, it's definitely going to be some changes for both guys. But when I look at Moffitt, I see, man, this guy's big for 45s. This guy's got a, a really good frame. I mean, the guy moves forward. He's not afraid to bang. Uh, he's got serious entries on his takedowns, his jujitsu's no slouches, dark choke his money. I mean, I see a guy like Moffat and I'm like, man, this guy should be, you know, man, he should be serious. I feel like he should probably be beating guys like Bryce Mitchell. It just seems that, uh, Bobby Moffat's issue is, you know, that he's prone to getting dropped and knocked down. And, you know, once that starts happening, you know what happens when some of those black belts, when there's punches involved, and sometimes they don't start thinking straight. And that's probably the type of black belt he is, kind of similar to a, a, a Cesar Mutanchi Ferrer. But uh, when he is out there coherent, man, the guy's super talented. His scrambles are, I ain't going to lie, man, his scrambles are impressive. And Enrique is definitely not a guy that typically puts himself in those positions. He's very disciplined in his wrestling. But if a guy like Moffat gets on top of you fresh, I mean, there's a chance he gets that dart. So I respect Moffat's ground game. Um now, Enrique, on the other hand, his fight with Gabriel Benitez was such a great performance. I mean, those two stood in the pocket, they bang. Enrique took him down over and over again. Then you see him in fights like uh, Matt Bissett, you know, another clinic, Brandon Davis, you know, more of the same. But I will say that it seems like progressively that Enrique, you know, that the size disadvantage that he has may be coming into factor more. Because, you know, when you look at his fights against uh, Bissett, Brandon Davis, and then Kevin Aguilar, each fight, you know, of those moments, even though I thought two of those were clinics and all those fights, there is a little bit more of Enrique, you know, kind of playing around on the outside a little bit too much, at least. I mean, like, he's a hundred times better than Bissett. He could probably get a first-round finish Bissett if he really put his mind to. But it just seems that he was out there dancing around a little bit too much more than he should have. Uh, he got rocked against Brandon Davis, but he also dominated Davis. But then in the Aguilar fight, he kind of stood in front of Aguilar. And I know Aguilar is a super big boy. He's huge. It just seems like Enrique... You know, was uh, just not, uh, I would say he was kind of losing focus in there a little bit. But, you know, now he's switching camps to AKA, and I feel like that's a good move. You know, he's a, Enrique's a hard worker, a guy that gets a lot of takedowns, a guy that's really grimy. And maybe they can reset Enrique a little bit to get back to his, to uh, just a little bit more cleaner performances against guys that he's way better than. So Bobby Moffitt, in comparison to Enrique, in terms of boxing, I feel truly believe that if Enrique, you know, is improving his boxing down there with Coach uh, Pops at AKA, and, you know, if he's really doing his thing down there, I feel like there's a chance he could possibly knock Moffat out. I mean, we've seen Moffat knocked out stiff on Access TV against Tom Lee. We saw him get dropped against Bryce Mitchell. And we know what happens when he gets dropped. He starts uh, he starts losing his mind in there. So I wouldn't count Bobby Moffat out. I think he's a super talented guy. But I think with the camp switch at ATT, I, I, I'm going to, you know, go on that angle. I think that if he, he's a little bit more focused, and I feel like if he – you know, just uses a little bit more anti-engage, anti-engage strategy. I really think he can mo knock Moffat out. There's a big speed difference between the two, and Moffat just he, he's just shown that he can't really come back after big knockdowns. So I think that if Enrique switches his style up a little bit, I feel like he could possibly get a knockout. And I just think he's the overall better fighter. You know, if it hits the mat. You know, Enrique makes good decisions on the mat. He doesn't engage in bullshit going back and forth. And I feel like if he does uh, get taken down, the only way Moffat can win is if it's the first round. I feel like if this fight progresses, Moffat would have already taken too much damage to uh, to have success in that area. So I'm going to go with Barzola by uh, third round TKO. Yeah, there's another one I'm really looking forward to. Obviously, Bobby Moffat definitely has a size advantage in this fight. He will be the bigger, larger man. So from his perspective, he's going to look to manhandle a guy in Enrique Barzola, try to get him down to that mat, try to force a takedown entry where he can set up that beautiful Darce choke. And for Enrique Barzola, you know, I mentioned how he was the smaller man. Definitely is. I mean, in my opinion, he could definitely drop to 135 pounds. It might, it might take a lot out of him. He might perform better at 45s, but he could definitely make the weight, whereas there's no chance in hell Bobby Muffett could make 135 is what I'm trying to say. But... On the flip side, Enrique is so much faster, and he pushes such a high pace. I truly believe that Enrique Barzola going to AKA is the best decision he ever made for his career. And that's no disrespect to ATT. I think that's an amazing gym as well. I just think for Enrique Barzola specifically, 
the kind of environment they have at AK is so perfect for him because Enrique Barzolo is a workhorse. I mean, what he's known for is not going out there and one punch knocking guys out. He's not going out there, you know, flying arm bars or anything like that. He's going out there and outworking guys, out hustling them. And that's the exact mindset they have over there at AK. You got guys like Daniel Cormier, Kane Velasquez, Habib Nurmagomedov, Islam Makhachev. So, when you're surrounded by guys like that, like-minded individuals, it can only elevate you to that next level. And I also know that Bobby Muffett is around a lot of motivated people as well at Fight Ready. It's just, I think, the combo of AKA with Enrique Barzolo. I think we might be seeing uh, the best Barzolo we've ever seen here. I mean, you know how they talk about fifth round Robbie Lawler and you know this and that. Well, I think I think AKA Barzola might be the new mythical creature. We'll, we'll see what actually happens on Saturday, but I'm expecting domination from Barzola in this fight, man. I think he can turn up on the feet too fast for him as well, and when he wants to take this to the mat, I think he will. And don't be surprised if he takes uh, Bobby Muffet's back as well. I've seen plenty of people do that. Lesser ranked guys do that as well. Uh, Bryce Mitchell, right? So I'm going Enrique Barzola here. Most likely a unanimous decision. Now, next up in the middleweight division, we got Oscar Pijota. He's 11-1, and and Rodolfo Vieira is 5-0. and Currently, they got Rodolfo Vieira minus 235. The comeback on Oscar Pijota is plus 195. Well, Shaq, they call Rodolfo Vieira the black belt hunter, and a lot of people are making it seem like he's the new Davi Hamos, he's the new Claudio Silva, he's the new Carlos Diego Ferreira that's about to come in here and submit everyone he fights. The only thing is, Shaq, he's taking on a Robert Drysdale black belt in Oscar Pijota. So I got to know, is the black belt Hunter uh, going to go out here and submit another black belt? Yeah, you know, this is an intriguing matchup. And Pijota, firstly, I'll go ahead and say, man, he is coming off a hellacious beating to the hands of uh, GM3 Merchardt. Now, granted, we know GM3 is a lot more accomplished than Rodolfo in terms of, you know, just experience and UFC fights. But, man, that was a, a hellacious beating. And his two fights prior to that you know he was able to fight he fought an athletic guy and jonathan wilson you know kind of uh exposed wilson on the ground um and then his fight against uh, tim williams he was able to get a first round knockout so piota was you know kind of a big a big prospect going into that gm3 fight but the way it went down man you know he, he actually took Mershart down which really isn't saying a lot but man the way it went down uh was definitely brutal and Vieira he's just one of those black belts that if he gets on top of you you know fresh with time on the clock you know there's a chance that you might not get up and you know it's just a matter of how those uh stand-up exchanges will go it's a matter of is Rodolfo gonna pull the trigger or is he gonna be a little lackluster and be a little green in some areas and you know I feel like Pijota's is still green in some areas too so like Rodolfo's got the power edge and I feel like he's probably got a confidence edge as well you know Pio, like I said Pijota's coming off a hellacious whooping so uh, I'm a, I'm a side with Rivera. I feel like he's also got the better jujitsu, but I mean you can't deny the fact that Piotr's a, a, a jujitsu world champion as well. Maybe not the same level as uh, Rodolfo Vieira, but he is a European BJJ champion. It is respectable. It is you know under that Drysdale lineage. So I definitely respect Piotr's game, but I gotta go with Rodolfo. He's been training with Perry for this camp in Florida. You know it seems like they took this seriously. So I think uh, Rodolfo gets this one. Oh uh, nice. So Rodolfo's over there with Julian Williams and Jacare and. Perry and all those guys it's it's a good environment there man so what's interesting to me about this one is that oftentimes when Vieira gets fights to the mat the fight's over shortly after can he do that here against a Robert Drysdale black belt because Drysdale isn't just out here handing out black belts you know you don't you don't open up the cereal box and get a black belt from Robert Drysdale you don't go to Amazon and order a black belt from Robert Drysdale to become a Robert Drysdale black belt you got to be you got to be serious, man. But they don't call this guy Rodolfo Vieira the black belt hunter for no reason. So, man, I, I'm just kind of torn because it's like if we were up here against some purple belt, oh, man, first round sub all day. And maybe he subs the black belt too. But uh, I do think that there can be some early adversity for uh, for Vieira and also on the feet as well, even though Pijota still, you know, iron out uh, the kinks in his game as well, no doubt about it. It's a tough one to call for me, but I still do lean with the favorite here, man. The confidence is a big factor here, and I'm just curious to see if his jujitsu really is just on a whole different level. Because if he goes out here and submits a Robert Drysdale black belt in the first round, that to me is going to be like, oh shit, like wow, maybe this guy really is like, you know, 
the black belt hunter. And, and the reason I'm even talking like this is because, you know, there was a fight between Davi Hamosh and Austin Hubbard, and it was a domination. You know, 30-26 on my scorecard absolutely blew the kid out the water, but I was under the impression that, you know, Davi takes his back one time and, you know, it's going to be a formality. We can look away and already start high-fiving that we cash the bet. And that wasn't the case, man. I mean, this kid, Austin Hubbard, was out here defending all the chokes. He still got dominated the entire fight. But the reason I'm bringing that up is because Austin Hubbard ain't no Drysdale black belt, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, I just think that there's a chance it might not be over if it hits the mat one time is all I'm saying. But I still do lean with the favorite. I just got to tune in and see for myself if he's the real deal or not. I got to see what happens firsthand. But I will pick uh, Vieira for the win. Light heavyweight division. We got Volkan Ozdemir. He's 15-4. And, and Alir Latifi is 14-6. and six. Currently, they got Volkan Uzdemir, minus 145. The comeback on Alir Latifi was plus 125. Well, Shaq, these two were initially supposed to fight earlier this year. Alir Latifi pulled out. Seems like Volkan Uzdemir can't catch a break. Do you think he gets back on track here uh, this Saturday night in Montevideo? This fight should have happened a couple months ago. And Latifi, uh, he said that his back was hurting, you know. So, you know, he is a big, muscular, stiff guy. So maybe there is something to it. Uh, you know, I haven't necessarily been too high on Latifi in the past, but... You know, he has uh, has proven me wrong in the past, you know, and in, in his fights like against OSP and uh, Tyson Pedro, you know, thing, you know, things like that. And Ozdemir, man, like you said, he hasn't been able to catch a break. A lot of people think that he beat uh, Dominic Reyes. I thought it was, you know, I thought it was a close fight. I thought it could have went either way. I didn't think it was the robbery that, you know, people thought it was. But Reyes is a lot more, you know, sustainable you know he's got the long rangey kicks he's 6'5 former d1 football player you know latifi i feel like he's got a, a knockout punch i mean i'll definitely respect that but historically speaking when you lean on latifi when you push latifi back like you saw in the Corey anderson fight what happens he completely shuts down and he gasses out and then he just pretty much starts selling out for big bombs now ozdemir on the other hand is also a very if he can't get a first round knockout in no time he turns into a punching bag occasionally he turns into a, a very slow, sl sloppy start squaring his stance. His ground game's not the best either, uh, defensively at least. This has the possibility to end quick, and I feel like it has the possibility to be a uh, ugly, disappointing fight on both sides. So I do feel like Volkan Ozdemir is a little bit tougher, you know, I, even though he lost to Lionheart Smith. I mean, look, when Lionheart Smith starts moving forward in the late rounds, I mean, it can be, it can be a scary thing. Um, but this guy, Latifi, man, his last fight against Corey was very telling. And, you know, I, I respect Corey Anderson. He is a very good, well-rounded fighter. But, I mean, he, he put it on Latifi in a way that I think it's going to start going downhill for Latifi. You know, he pulled out that fight a couple months ago. Finally feel like Volkan Ozdemir might catch a break and might return to his no-time ways. But I actually think this fight might go a little longer. I feel like Ozdemir is going to be the guy moving forward. I feel like it's going to be, you know, probably madness in that first round. But in the second and third rounds, I I feel like it's going to be sloppy, but Ozdemir is going to be moving forward, and he's going to show that he wants this more. So I'm going to go with Ozdemir by decision. Obviously, this fight's been a long time in the making, and with Alir Latifi, I was always kind of... I always kind of thought he was a bit suspect, and that's no disrespect. I mean, I love the horse lord gimmick and all this stuff, but I feel like people bought into that way too much. And, I mean, look, the guy was ranked number four in the world at one point, which I was like, what? Like... Hold on a sec. Did I just see that right? You, you know what I'm saying, Shaq? So, to me, he was never number four in the world. To me, he may, he might have been number 14 in the world, right? So, here against uh, Volkan Ozdemir, you know, Volkan's fallen on some hard times. But, I mean, look at the guys he's fallen on some hard times against, right? You know, you're talking about the champ Cormier. You're talking about a top three contender in Anthony Smith and a potential future top five guy in, in Reyes who many people thought that Volkan beat. So what's interesting here is that Volkan obviously has got a big height advantage. He's got the big reach advantage. But more important than that, he's got the output advantage. And when you talk about a guy like Latifi, the two things he's known for is either he gets the one-punch knockouts, you know, which he got in a couple of his fights, or he will do nothing and then uh, steal around with a takedown. Now, Volkan has a 75% takedown defense. It's not easy to take him down unless your name is Daniel Cormier. And the dude's got a pretty damn good chin, too. So I don't see Latifi knocking him out. I don't see Latifi wrestling him. I actually see Volkan coming out here and knocking Latifi out in the first round, man. So uh, 
I'm going Volcan to get his arm raised via vicious, devastating first round KO. Next up in the featherweight division, we got Humberto Bandene. He's 14 and 6, and Luis Eduardo Garagori is 12 and 0. Currently, they got Luis Garagori minus 115, and Humberto Bandene is minus 105. Well, Shaq, you got the Uruguayan taking on the Peruvian. And the Uruguayans undefeated. They got him here in the Coco main event in the featured bout for a reason because, I mean, he's the first Uruguayan fighter in UFC history. Man, do you think uh, he puts Uruguay on the map here against Bandanai? Yeah, this is an interesting fight. You know, Luis Eduardo Garagori, like you said, the only fighter from Uruguay in the UFC, and he's going to be the only uh, guy representing Uruguay on the night. This is his UFC debut, and this is in his home country. So there's definitely going to be a lot of pressure uh you know, a lot of pressure on him going into Saturday night. But, man, this guy seems like he doesn't really have much emotions. He doesn't really talk much. So he, he might be able to handle it. You know, fun fact, he was actually supposed to fight Andre Harrison in the PFL tournament. But, hey, he opted. They needed a guy. to. They were coming to Uruguay, and they needed a guy. So they went with uh, Gary Gorey. Now, his opponent, Band and I, He's got the 14-6 and six record. And Band and I, in comparison to his debut, these last two fights definitely – have not gone his way and I mean he's out here getting dominated by Austin Arnett in the third round which is not a good thing but then you know in my experience is knowing the 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 uh the, the side of the world that he comes from you know Peru I mean guys you go look at that, that their level of MMA man it's just not very good you know uh these guys when they come to the UFC kind of like uh uh Marlon Chito Vera, these guys have to play catch up. So as for example, you see guys like Marlon Chito Vera, you go back three, four years ago, he was losing to guys like Davey Grant and um, and Marco Psycho Beltran. Now, fast forward a few years later with more time, improvement, training, and, and you know, more comfortability in that octagon. Now he's, uh, you know, uh, a budding star. You know, now he's trying to get a fight with Jimmy Rivera. You know, let's see if, uh, <laughs> if Jimmy uh, accepts. <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, that's the case for a lot of these Spanish fighters. Um, even guys like, uh, even on the Mexican scene, you know, that, you know, uh, they're, they're kind of playing catch up and Humberto's a guy that's only 24 years old. So him actually losing to guys like Arnett as where it would kind of be viewed as, oh my God, you lost to Arnett. You, you know, uh, you got knocked out in a few seconds. Quite frankly, it, it, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't, it kind of makes somewhat kind of sense. I mean, Arnett was 15 and five. He's 14 and five with a very low level of competition and hey, he lost. So I'm actually not going to be, not going to shit on him too hard for that loss because He's just not on that level. Now, his opponent, Gregory, on the other hand, he's 12-0, has pretty much dominated every fight he's been in on the Uruguayan scene. He's also coming from a very low level of MMA. His last uh, two fights were against 0-0 zero and zero guys. But like I said, even the guys with winning records, he dominated. The bums, he dominated. It's just uh, I haven't really seen him in really too much tough positions. You know, I just know that he has a hard body kick. And uh, when he takes guys down... Uh, he usually gets the full mount and starts pounding their heads, but I'm going to be under the assumption that those guys have completely no ground games. Um, Humberto Ben and I, you know, I don't know what to expect because I do think there is somewhat of a heart issue. There has been a bit of a heart issue throughout his whole career. I mean, he has broken several times before, but he is also very young. He is also very improving. So I do think there is a chance that he shows up a lot better. I feel like he's got a good left kick. I feel like he's 6'1", very tall for the weight class. And Garagori, I feel like he does his job. He seems like a very, seems like a more mature guy than Humberto. Seems like he uh, just has that cool demeanor about him. I just haven't really seen him get hit on the chin too hard. I haven't, you know, I've seen him get taken down before. But, you know, just never really in any tough spots as we're and the reason i'm bringing this up because this is the ufc now this is not in you know these little gymnasiums that he's used to fighting in this is a uh, in a big arena in his home country and the stakes are a lot higher and humberto's been here before and he hasn't so you know i feel like it's a uh, uh you know i feel like it's appropriately lined to you know pick them either side give or take either side but i will side with gary Goy just do that he seems a little bit more mature seems like he's got better rest on Saturday night if Humberto puts him there. But uh, I think Humberto's going to show up a little better, and I think uh, it's going to be a good fight. But I think uh, Gary Gore's probably a little bit more tougher. Probably, I think they probably got about the same stand-up. And I'm saying that 
with the idea that Humberto is going to come a little bit better. But uh, I think that Garrett Gore is probably going to get an extra takedown, maybe out hustle him and win a decision in his home country. But I wouldn't be shocked if it went the other way. Yeah, there definitely is a little bit of guesswork involved in this matchup just because, like Shaq alluded to, we have not seen Luis Garagori take any hard shots. We haven't seen him in any bad position, so we don't know how he reacts. But one thing we do know is how Humberto Band and I reacts in those bad spots because let's not even talk about the UFC. Let's talk about on the regional scene. I mean, the guy's going out there tapping out to forearm chokes. Now, on one hand, you can look at it and say, I mean, he's just a kid. You know, he was only 22 when that happened, and you're 100% correct. But on the other hand, I mean, we got other 22-year-olds who, you know, wouldn't be caught dead tapping out to, to shit like that, right? So it, it's one of those things where is he going to mature more and as a result be more calm in those bad situations, or is that just kind of how it's going to go. Is that just what the tale is anytime Humberto Band and I gets in a bad spot? So that's what really needs to be determined for me because I do agree he's a young developing fighter and that we're going to see a better version each time, but I just need to know firsthand when he gets put back in those tough spots, is he going to be able to work his way out of them or is it just like, man, uh, that's it, right? So as far as his offensive weapons, the left kick, that's his go-to, and off his back, very nice hips with that arm bar. I mean, he can get that arm bar out of nowhere. I mean, he got dropped by Gabriel, and if that was someone else not as experienced as Gabriel, he would have got that first-round arm bar, but, you know, Gabriel is fighting on a pay-per-view versus Sodiq Youssef. I mean, it's a completely different caliber. Now, with Luis Garagori, the things I can say about him, I do believe he's a Muay Thai champion, you know. Put that in whatever, hold that in whatever regard you want, but I believe he does have the credentials to call himself a Muay Thai champion. Very hard kicks, a nice spin, but what I like the most is when he gets on top, he's got vicious ground and pound. I mean, those elbows, I mean, it kind of reminded me, you know, not to get ahead of myself, it was just the same kind of viciousness when I saw John Jones fight Matt Hamill. It's like that kind of stuff, but granted, he's out here against, you know, <laughs> against, uh, you know what I'm saying? The safety patrol guy in high school, right? So, of course, he's going out there smashing them. Can he do that to Humberto Bandanai as well? I don't know. That's the big question. So, I kind of wouldn't lay the chalk on Luis Garagori, but you give me plus 100, you give me some kind of plus odds, and I might be willing to take that risk, might be willing to take that one-unit shot to find out, is he good enough to show up in his home country, be the first man in Uruguayan MMA history to win inside the UFC's octagon. So I think he actually does become that man. I will pick Luis Garagori here, but don't go too big on this one because there's still a lot of unknowns about both guys, but I will side with uh, the home country guy, Luis Garagori. Co-main event of the evening in the welterweight division. We got Vicente Luque. He's 16-6-1, and, and Platinum Mike Perry is 13-4. and four. Currently, they got Vicente Luque, minus 220. The comeback on Mike Perry is plus 180. Shaq, I have a feeling these two are going to either stand and bang until one man falls, or they're going to stand and bang until both guys have 50k bonuses in their pockets. Who do you see getting their arm raised here in Uruguay? Man, this is going to be a great fight. I haven't necessarily been on high as Luque as others have been in the lead up into this fight over the couple of years, you know. I actually thought his fight with Barbarina was lined a little bit too high, and uh, the fight kind of played out that way. He was able to get the third round knockout. And the only reason why I say that is I just always had the suspicion that Luque has progressively been getting a little chinnier. And, you know, I'll go ahead and say overall, I think he's 100 percent better than Mike Perry, just caliber wise, performance wise. It's just that occasionally, man, you know, when Luque loses, it's usually, you know, a. Uh, kind of a, a big stunt, man. And his last fight with Derek Krantz, you know, we know that Magni pulled out, you know, due to that LG3, LGD dash, whatever it was. And we know what Luke brings to the table. I mean, the guy's got sharp straights, big left hooks, stars choke. Um, I mean, Luke, he's definitely an offensive juggernaut. I feel like some of his opponents, when you really look at them, you know, Jalen Turner, I, I like that kid, but I mean, do I have to really explain that? You know, um, Nico Price, although Nico Price is a dog, he's got big power in his hands. Nico takes a lot of punches. And, you know, Vicente was able to do his thing there. Not saying that Mike Perry doesn't because Mike Perry definitely lost to uh, Max Griffin along with some other ones. But uh, Vicente is probably the better puncher. It's just that occasionally he can make a big mistake like you saw in the Leon fight, like you saw in the Barbarina fight where all of a sudden he takes one punch and he's on his ass. And next thing you know, Barb smashing his head. Uh, smashing his head 
And then next thing you know, when Vicente's a little tired, next thing you know, he turns into a punching bag. He starts shelling up, you know, just trying to look to counter on the left hook. And, you know, that works out for him, uh, you know, a lot of the time. Now, Perry, on the other hand, he's coming off that win over Alex Cowboy. And now, although I think Alex Cowboy was playing, definitely playing some games in that fight, you know, I'll tell you what, I'll IQ from Perry that I've seen in a while. You know, generally I've referred to Perry as an idiot in the past and <laughs> a complete joke, a complete fraud. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you what he actually showed some smarts in that fight and he's got underrated wrestling he's got power in his hands we know that uh perry at one point at a hundred percent knockout rate although it was against very chinny guys but the guy does have power in his hands he is tenacious and i'll tell you what he plays very good mental games with people as we saw earlier today in their face off with you know him doing uh doing all the screaming and look i'll tell you what that shit can get in some guys heads man perry's a super intense guy and, you know, sometimes guys fight a little bit out of character. Now, I feel like the only way Perry's going to be able to win this fight is by it has to start off with a knockdown. You know, he's not going to come out here and, you know, <laughs> take Vicente down and, you know, tie him up for 15 minutes. Uh, even though he is a strong guy, it's going to have to be able, like as Vicente is getting off on his offense, he's going to be able to have to capitalize on Vicente, you know, slightly leaving uh, his hands a little bit close to his head. That's why he's prone to those hooks, man. So I feel like Perry's live for a knockout punch in this fight, to be honest. I feel like the line's a little bit too wide. I mean, you look at Vicente's last fight against Krantz, he came out and got caught with a big punch there as well. Krantz took that fight on short notice. You know, I just think that Mike Perry with his intensity level and with the style of Vicente Luque, although he does dish out a lot of knockouts, we can't sleep out on the knockout power of Mike Perry in a fight like this. You know, if he was fighting a slightly more disciplined guy, a, sli a slightly more, you know, uh, mixes it up with a takedown here and there, you know, i definitely say Perry gets outclassed. You know, I am going to pick Vicente Luque, but from a betting perspective, I think it's Mike Perry or pass. I do think Vicente is better, but, you know, uh, I think people should be looking at this fight as if, does Mike Perry have a chance to win? Not, is uh, Vicente a lock, you know? Dude, I feel you 100% because obviously you mentioned how, you know, we definitely cannot discredit the win streak that Vicente Luque is on. I mean, to go on that kind of streak inside the octagon and just to... To get as many finishes as he has, I mean, he's one of the only men, one of, I say, the only men to start off his UFC career with his first nine wins are all finishes, right? So if he goes out here and gets another finish, it's not often you hear of guys getting their first 10 wins inside the octagon, inside the distance, Shaq, so that would be quite a feat. But at the same time, look, it's not his fault that he was in there with Chad Lepree, Jalen Turner, and Derek Krantz, but that is some soft competition that Mike Perry would also beat, not saying... Mike Perry would be, you know, Barbarena or Nico Price or Bilal Muhammad, but even though Luke is on this big win streak, you know, some of that competition has been a little bit soft. You just have to, you just have to be honest about it. But when you talk about Vicente's skills, I mean, he's got one of the best left hooks in the entire sport. I mean, I remember when Paul Daly used to be the welterweight with, uh, with the left hook. Well, now it's Vicente Luque is the guy with the left hook you got to look out for in the 170-pound division. And not just that. I mean, you start to shoot on a guy like Vicente Luque, all of a sudden you're, uh, you're out cold with a darts joke. And not to mention, let's not just talk about that left hand. What about his calf kick game, which is very, very on point too. So Vicente Luque is a very well-rounded guy. It's just that sometimes he gets a little carried away in there you know man he's a finisher for sure and when you get into these wild brawls sometimes it can be 50 50 now when we talk about his dance partner mike perry he lives in these wild brawls that's what makes this fight so intriguing because you talk about a guy like mike perry and you know his back was definitely up against the wall going into that paul felder fight i mean we're talking about two back-to-back -back losses the santiago ponzinibbio one you know we can all excuse that because I don't know about you guys, but I consider Pons to be a top five guy. But the Max Griffin one in, in Orlando, Florida, that's when we were kind of like, all right, uh, Mike Perry's got to figure some things out. Well, guess what, Shaq? He did figure some things out. He's won two of his last three. I mean, beat Paul Felder. That's a top 10 guy at 55. Beat Alex Cowboy Oliveira, who's a former top 15 guy at 170. And he had the setback to Donald Cerrone. I mean, Donald Cerrone's beat half the roster. So I don't, I don't see much shame in that. But what I did like about the last two wins for Mike Perry was that he really turned it up in the second and third rounds, man, in both those wins. And if he's going to win this fight, I mean, obviously, besides catching Vicente Luque, it might be in his best interest to turn up in the second and third round in this fight as well. Because one thing we've noticed, Shaq, is that, I mean, Vicente Luque, amazing fighter, but 
if there is some kind of weakness, he does slow down a little bit. Now, granted, he did get that third-round knockout against the Barb, so he is dangerous late as well. But I'm just saying the, the most scariest Vicente is in that first round. So if Mike Perry can be on his P's and Q's and maneuver, and I say that you know kind of funnily because you're talking about Mike Perry, the guy that loves to go in there and brawl with everyone he fights. But if he can show some smarts like he did in that Alex Cowboy fight, even the Paul Felder fight, he does have a path to victory. And I agree with Shaq when he says this is a dog or pass situation. It's just if if this was a pick em, I lean with Vicente Luque. So he is my pick to win this fight, but the line is not a pick em at all. And uh, there might be some value on Mike Perry is all I got to say. But my pick is going to be Vicente Luque via decision. But we'll see what happens. Uh, I mean, if this hits plus 200, it might not even be about who your pick is. It might just be about that value, right? So keep your eyes uh, peeled to that line. Main event of the evening for the 125-pound belt. We got the champion, Valentina Shevchenko. She's 17-3. and three, And the challenger, Liz Carmouche, is 13-6. and six. Currently, they got Valentina Shevchenko minus 1275. The comeback on Liz Carmouche is plus 825. Well, Shaq, I know for a fact you're not betting Valentina straight at minus 1275. So what, what I got to ask you is, is plus 825 odds intriguing enough for you to go out there and bet the first person to ever beat Valentina Shevchenko? Yeah, unfortunately, I think I would need plus 5,000 odds, you know, <laughs> to... Uh to uh, possibly take a shot and it just comes down from the fact that you know like I, I got respect for Liz you know she's got these wins over Jennifer Maya Chu Kagi and some serious competition uh and, you know when you look at her fight with Lucy Putalova although I thought she won that fight it was still somewhat in reach for Lucy Putalova and Lucy's on the three fight tapped out by uh you know Valentina's big sis so you know, I feel like Liz Carmouche is a tough girl. She's very strong. She She's known for her slams. I know you remember that slam when she dumped Chukagian on her head. But, uh, you know, we, we, we know what's going to happen here. Valentina is going to win this fight. And, you know, it, to me, it's just a matter of if it's going to be a finish or – uh, or this, or a 50-44, you know, I feel like there is a chance she gets a knockout because I've always had the skepticism that Liz Carmouche is, you know, is scared to get hit sometimes. And she's been working around it because her grappling is so much better than, you know, the Jennifer Mayas and the Chukagians and the Pudalovas, but that's not going to be the case here. I feel like Valentina can win this fight by submission or uh, or by knockout, you know. I feel like uh, she's going to roll here and, and pro- I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say second round arm bar. So I'm going to go with... Uh, Valentina by finish. Yeah, I mean, the big question in this fight is, is it going to go to decision or not? And a lot of people are saying it is going to go to decision because Liz Carmouche is historically tough to finish. And I disagree, Shaq. I mean, first of all, I don't know if you recall, but I recall that third round between Chukagian and Carmouche where Chukagian dropped Carmouche. And listen, when when the number one... Er- <laughs> when the no- hey, 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 Dan, hey, Dan, can, can I just say something real quick? Yeah. No girl that lost to Alexis Davis in 2018 has beaten Valentina. You know the the number one air striker ever dropped Liz Carmouche, right? So we're t- we're saying air strikers are out here dropping, and you're telling me the bullet won't do it too. So I mean, yeah, I think she can knock her out standing. I think she can sub her on the mat. I mean, maybe an early takedown from Carmouche to kind of get everyone a little, you know, a little more excited. You know, remember when she took Ronda Rousey's back as a big underdog and lost shortly after so you know maybe she'll have a moment here and there but at the end of the day the tools are sharper in all areas not just the stand-up shack in all areas i got valentina shevchenko here via domination i'm gonna say under four and a half rounds and joining us now on the big marley minute is big marley himself kyle it's going down the rematch this saturday in montevideo how's it going kyle hey great man coming off of a 3-0 week so i can't complain uh, did well on DraftKings as well, so I'm just ready to keep this streak going, get another win this week, and then next week we got the finals for the qualifier. I'm going to go to New York City. I'm going to watch it there, hopefully party hardy, uh, and win more money. So let's make it three in a row, making this week the second one. Well, I got to ask you off the top, man. Obviously, Valentina Shevchenko coming off that head kick knockout. She's 9,600 in DraftKings. Liz Carmouche is 6,600. She's the cheapest on the entire slate. And not only that... She beat Valentina the first time they fought. She finished Jessica Andrade. Do you think there's any value here with the underdog? Uh, I mean, maybe a little bit, but I I don't really see how she gets this win. Um, I don't think she can really wrestle hard for five rounds to get the win, so she's probably going to need to finish, in my opinion, and I don't see her getting that done. So 
Um, Valentina is going to be the pick here for me. I just I think she's going to dominate on the feet as long as it's there. But I, I do think Carmouche is going to land some takedowns. I just I think she's going to end up getting caught with a submission. Um, and I see Valentina putting her away. Um, so I actually bet <clears throat> yesterday I took Valentina. Well, it was actually the fight doesn't go to the decision. I wanted to bet Valentina inside the distance, but the line wasn't much better. So I just got fight doesn't go to a decision. Uh, and I do like Valentina a lot. The only issue is she's 9,600. And there's I like all the 9K people this card. So it's just going to be uh, if you can afford her or not. I think she's a better cash game play because she's the only – I mean, if you want to say lock, you, uh, she's the only lock on the card. But she might not have the ceiling as these other 9K guys have. So um, I, I won't be loading up on her, but she's definitely my preferred play here. And I do think she gets a submission um, before the championship rounds. So Kyle Marley's giving out a free bet right here, right now on half the battle. You're playing that this main event between Valentina Shevchenko and Liz Carmouche does not go the five round distance. Is that right, Kyle? Correct. Fade the Greek. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens there. I think I think uh, you got a good chance, man. And look, the co-main event between Vicente Luque and Mike Perry. What can I say? It's going to be a very exciting fight. Are you leaning more towards the favorite here, or do you think there's a a little you think there might be a little sneaky upset here in Mike Perry? <laughs> I mean, shit, if we're going on that fade the Greek thing, maybe <laughs> there is some value here in Perry. So I am interested. But no, I got to go with uh, Luke as the pick. <clears throat> he's just a better fighter everywhere. Um, he's, he's pretty much a lock for 100 points when he wins. Uh, and I think it would be smart of him to take this fight to the ground. If he does that, I think he's going to get a submission. Um, and that could come in any round. But this guy, he has a style to put up 100 plus points in a decision. I think he had 140 against Barbarina, and that was like a last second knockout. He, he wouldn't have had a whole lot less if it went to a decision. And Perry's going to bring it too. So I love this fight. It's going to be a fight that's in basically all my lineups. But I, I like Luke as my preferred pick. If I was making one lineup, I would probably have to prefer to have Luke in there. But if Perry wins, it's probably by knockout. And if he hits Luke like Barbarina was in that fight, I don't see Luke standing. So I uh, love this fight. Whoever, whoever wins should score highly and probably be on that 25K lineup. What's Kyle Marley's opinion on the stack in this fight? Uh, I might, yeah, I'm not against it uh, for cash, but I just don't see me. I don't know. I don't really like cash games that much this week. Actually, I don't think I'm going to play a whole lot of them. Um, I posted some like one one to five dollars. Um, I don't really care if I lose those, but I'm, I don't see me playing any you know five hundred dollar games this week because I don't trust enough um, of the people in my cash lineup uh, as of yet. So I'm not I'm not against it because I do think we're locked in for a hundred plus points in this fight, uh, and that's really all I'm looking for. It also guarantees you the win. Um, so yeah, I think it's solid. It may be even better than the main event. So featherweight division, you got Humberto Band and I taking on the Uruguayan Eduardo Garagori. And uh, man, I mean, it's Garagori's debut. He's been smashing the regional scene, guys, exactly how you're supposed to. The question is, is he going to come here under the bright lights and do the same thing? Man, I, I have no idea. I, I really don't have a good read on this fight at all. Um, so my, my best read is really for DraftKings. I think it's going to be a low-owned fight because neither one of these are big names. Um, people are much going to... I'm, well, they would much rather choose to go to somebody like a Mike Perry or Luke. So I just think this fight in general is going to go under owned. And I think it is going to inside and inside the distance, <clears throat> no matter who wins. So I like targeting both sides of this fight. My preferred play is Garagori. Uh, I just like more what I've seen from him. Um, but I think they're both pretty low level. And one of them could make a mistake if finished in the first round. And it, Either one of these guys is probably on the 25K lineup with the first round finish. So I will be targeting both of them in GPPs, not touching this fight in cash because I don't trust either one of them enough for that. But Garagori is my preferred play. And I do think this fight ends in, in the first or second round. So Volkan Ozdemir is taking on Elir Latifi. As you know, these two were scheduled to fight earlier this year. Now it's finally going to go down. Who are you taking? I'm um, going to go with Volcan in this one. <clears throat> I just think he, he's a better all-around fighter. I think he'll be able to keep this fight standing where he'll have the advantage. Um, but I, I think he's going to need a knockout to score highly on DraftKings because uh, he's not going to be going for takedowns. He's just going to be standing the whole time. And I don't see him putting up a high enough pace to be on the 25K lineup without a finish. So I think we're really relying on the knockout here if we're drafting him. So I don't I don't love him at 85K, but he is my preferred play. Um 
I do think he's going to go out there and get a 30-27 win. Um, maybe maybe Latifi gets like one, two takedowns. But I think for the most part, Volkan's going to be able to stuff him, and I see him being the better striker winning it there. Oscar Pijota is welcoming Rodolfo Vieira to the UFC. And interestingly enough, you got the Robert Drysdale black belt and Oscar Pijota taking on the man known as the black belt hunter in Rodolfo Vieira. So, I mean, you think this fight's going to hit the mat right away? You think these two grapplers are going to strike? Uh, how you see it going down? No, nah, I mean, I don't see Vieira wanting to strike at all. I think uh, Pichota would be smart to want to strike. If, she, if he could stuff takedowns, I think he's going to win this fight. Um but I, I don't think he's stuffing those takedowns, man. Vieira looked like the real deal, um, and like almost like a Khabib-esque type of fighter where he's just going to be going for takedowns constantly, and he, he's pretty good at getting them. Maybe maybe Pichota can get up two, three, four times and still get finished in the first round. Um, I, I like how I like Vieira's game plan. He, he knows what he needs to do. He's going to go out there, try to put on a, an impressive show for his UFC debut. He's going to be looking for takedowns in the first 10 seconds probably, and I think – it's bound to hit the mat at some point. When it does, I think he dominates and probably finds his way to a submission. So I like him to get a first-round finish here. Uh, he's one of my favorite plays on the card. He is $500 cheaper than Valentina, so that's like one of the reasons I don't know how much Shevchenko I'll be able to get. I mean, if I can not lock in you know, a first-round finish, but in my mind, I see a first-round finish from Vieira for $500 cheaper. I'd rather just go ahead and take him, honestly. So uh, he's going to be one of my favorite plays on the board, and I'm looking forward to his debut. So last but not least, you got Enrique Barzola taking on Bobby Moffitt. And I'd expect the winner to score relatively high. I mean, Barzola can go out there, stack up the takedowns. You know, Bobby Moffitt's got that money, Darce Choke. Uh, which way are you leaning? Yeah, I think it's going to be a fun fight. Uh, could be lots of grappling in this one. Uh, I, I picked Barzola as my pick to win, but my preferred play here is going to be Moffitt. I mean, I've already picked all the favorites so far on the cards. So we got to find underdogs somewhere. Even if you don't think they're going to win, if you think they're live and if you think they're going to finish if they win, that's what you want to target. So I think Moffitt is live in this fight. I like that he's going to be looking to grapple, try to get a submission, something like that. Um, and if he can get it, he could score highly. So I would rather have the underdog here. I know Barzola is going to be popular because he can go out there and get 10 takedowns on anybody. And people people know that at this point. So he's just going to be a popular play every card he's on at this point. Uh, so I would rather just go the other way, target against the mask going towards Barzola and give me the, the better submission grappler. So um, I'm not picking him to win, but I'm picking him as my preferred play, and I'll be hoping that he wins. So give me Moffitt. Well, Kyle, that's why you are the DraftKings guy for half the battles going down this Saturday in Uruguay. They can follow you at Big Marley 3, and they can get your bets and your write-ups at bestfightpicks.com. That's right, man. I just sent both of those your way, so uh, I'm ready to go. i got three more. Straight plays this week, hoping to go another 3-0. and oh. DraftKings is only $7.99. You guys will for sure enjoy it. Uh, hundreds of people read it every week, so hop on board. I think you'll enjoy it. It'll give you an edge over the field, and good luck, everybody. Well, Shaq, now we got to talk about the fight to watch and the fighter to watch. So what is the fight to watch for UFC Uruguay? My fight to watch is going to be Mike Perry versus Vicente Luque. I mean, we already saw the face-off from earlier today. We know... Uh, Emotions are going to be flying high in that co-main event, and somebody's probably going to get knocked out. I mean, look at Perry's history. Look at Vicente's history. I mean, Vicente, when he gets guys, they're generally down for the count for a little while. So that'll be my fight to watch. Yeah, I mean, I don't know any true fight fan that's going to be tuning into this card and is not going to be extra intrigued by Vicente Luque versus Mike Perry. That's obviously one of the fights to watch. But for me, Mine's on the prelims, man. I'm going with Howley and Paiva versus Rogerio Bontorin, man. I really do believe that this is going to be the flyweight version of World War III. I just think these two are going to have an absolute madness, a scramble fest, a brawl, just a knock them out, drag them out type fight. You know, uh, another version of Pantoja versus Figueredo, but maybe a little bit closer. Uh, you know, I did pick this fight to be a draw. I think this is the first draw I've ever picked in half the battle history. I just think that's... I just think that speaks volumes to how good this fight really is going to be and how high level these two competitors truly are in my mind. So, Howley and Paiva versus Hogeria Bontarin is my fight to watch. Well, Shaq, who is your fighter to watch for UFC Uruguay? My fighter to watch is going to be Alexei Kunchenko. I mean, this guy's a 20-0 Russian. 
Uh, I mean, you don't really see too many 21-0 and fighters. If he's able to get this win, I mean, I don't know how you deny this guy a shot at one of the top 20, 25 guys in the world. I mean, he's already fighting Burns, who is borderline top 15 at 155. But if Konchenko moves on to 21-0, and I feel like it's time to give him a real step up. You know, maybe uh, a Claudio Silva or, you know, uh, you know a, a decent size step up. So, you know, Alexi's my fighter to watch. Yeah, he's definitely one of the guys to watch. I mean, 21 and 0 speaks for itself. So no no questions asked there. For me, it's uh the newest addition to the bantamweight division, Geraldo De Freitas. Look, this is a guy who's 5 foot 9 with a 73 inch reach making his bantamweight debut. He's already huge for the weight class. Then you topple that with the fact that he's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He can really mix his striking to his takedowns very effectively, and he's got a willing dance partner in Chris Gutierrez where there is a lingering hole in his ground game that Geraldo can expose. For that reason, Geraldo de Freitas is my fighter to watch. Well, Shaq, we did it. It's going down this Saturday, and we just got to remind them that they can get our bets at bestfightpicks.com. And right now, we're running the special 10% off Shaq's bets by using the promo code Shaq at bestfightpicks.com. And not only that, you're also offering, if this event doesn't profit, you get the next two free. Buy one, get two free going for this weekend in UFC Uruguay and uh, me and Dan definitely plan on cashing these these fucking bets you guys heard if this event doesn't profit Shaq's gonna offer the next two free use the promo code Shaq to get 10% off Shaq's individual package and you can also get my bets at bestfightpicks.com as well make sure you subscribe to Half the Battle on iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify and all the places that you can find Half the Battle we truly appreciate all your support and hook up those 5 star reviews on iTunes if you hook up that 5 star review you send me a screenshot i will send you my bets for this weekend again follow me at best fight picks follow shack at mma genius 05 our bets are available at bestfightpicks.com we truly appreciate all the support we love you all and until the next time let's cash these bets